I'm Olaf Kramer from Tübingen University. I work at the rhetoric department of Tübingen University in the field of science communication. And is, it is my honor and pleasure to host the HLF Poster Flash. This HLF Poster Flash has some very simple ideas behind it. The first is we've got 30 young researchers. They've got two minutes and they've got two slides to talk about their work, to share their thoughts and ideas with you. And I think we can give them a big round of applause as they are brave enough to enter this very special stage. They are sitting up there. So please, for our young researchers. Robert Metcalf told us about the fascinating story behind Ethernet, the Ethernet, uh, this morning and talked about connections quite a lot. And the basic idea behind this poster flash is also to connect. And it's about the purest form of connection that is out there in the world, the connection between people in the same room at the same time. And if this connection works out and if you find a common ground and reach common goals, that goals, that is really pure magic. And about this connection is HLF since it was founded 10 years ago. So now let's start our poster flash and we will start with a row of presentations from the fields of mathematics. And the first one to enter the stage and please welcome him very, very friendly with a give him a big hand will be Stefano Franzoni from the University of Oxford. Please, step up. <laughs> Finite volume scheme for fractional diffusion on bounded domains. The floor is yours. Now, one thing we like to do in applied mathematics is model diffusion and diffusion processes. Diffusion of particles, diffusion of species. And uh, if we take uh, the standard Laplacian, a very easy operator, what we have is standard diffusion. So we model particles that move of Brownian motion. But if we change from the standard Laplacian to the fractional Laplacian, what we get is a complete different type of diffusion. We now model particles that moves according to another stochastic process, that is the Levy walk. Now, this type of movement is much more um, realistic if we want to model, say, the movement of bacteria, of antibodies. And so my work has been precisely to design a finite volume scheme for this type of diffusion. And I did that uh, finding, say, a different definition of the fractional relation unbounded domains and the advantages of my method, of my, uh, my algorithm, is that first, we overcome somehow some singularities that are present in the definition of the fractional Laplacian. Second, it is very easy to prescribe boundary conditions with this method, which is not an easy task when we deal with fractional Laplacian. And third, the whole implementation, because it is a finite volume scheme, is very intuitive. So thank you, and if you want to have more information, please come to visit my poster. Thank you. Okay, and the next one in row is Shika Gozin from Michigan State University. Ishika will be talking about merge tree magic, study of leaf morphology through topological data analysis. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. So uh, my research topic is topological data analysis, or TDA. It's a very exciting new field. Uh, now, in TDA, what we do, uh, in short, is that if you give me a shape, an object, or a data set, uh, we find out topological summaries of that da data set using uh, tools from algebraic topology. These uh, summaries are much more easier to understand and they're machine readable. And then you can perform a statistical analysis on it or you can feed it to a machine learning model and you get nice results. So as TDA researcher, my focus is the second circle here. So one of the many tools that TDA has 
we have something called a merge tree. Uh, it's a tree-like structure that encapsulates the uh, connected components, the evolution of connected components uh, across one direction that you choose. Uh, and if, you, if your data set comes with some label information, uh, and if you preserve that label information in your merge tree, then you get labeled merge tree. And one nice thing about that is that we can capture that uh, labeled merge tree information in a matrix. And that is nice, because we like, like matrices, uh, they're easily computable, and we can manipulate them. So in short, I study merge trees. And to do so, I am right now working with uh, leaf morphological data of around 40 species of passiflora plants, uh, as you can see the picture here. So what I'm trying to do here is uh, to assert some kind of a notion of a distance so that I can compare two merge trees, which is a non-trivial task. I also want to reconstruct back my shape if you give me some merge trees of the space. And right now what I'm trying to figure out is uh, that if I can uh, assert a notion of an average leaf shape by averaging out merge tree. If you would like to know what I do uh, with merge trees or with leaves, or if you want to just discuss what TDA is, do drop by my poster. Thank you so much. From Yeshiva University in New York, we have Samuel Eckingbait with us, and he will talk about Hamiltonian systems, about instability in the system. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, in the presence of dissipation, energy can be lost. But we discovered that under the combined effects of a time periodic Hamiltonian perturbation and a dissipation, it is possible to gain energy. So uh, as a model, we consider uh, a, an Hamiltonian, which is, uh, which is related to an uncoupled rotator pendulum. And this is uh, endowed with a standard symplectic structure. So to this system, we had a small time periodic Hamiltonian perturbation of special type, where epsilon is the uh, coupling parameter. Also, we had uh, the dissipative perturbation, where uh, rho, is, rho there is the dissipation parameter. So now, this system is uh, no longer symplectic, but exact conformally symplectic. And uh, here is the result. So for the first time, our result extends the Arnold diffusion problem of uh, 1964 to systems with small dissipation. And it says that if we assume that the dissipation parameter is, uh, is equal to a small positive constant divided by log of one by epsilon, then there are pseudo orbits along which the energy of the rotor grows by an amount which is uh, independent of the size of the coupling parameter epsilon for all sufficiently small values of epsilon. So this is just an introduction, and to get the full gist, please uh, visit my poster. Thank you. Next speaker is Jayuti, who comes to us from India, from Punjab University, and she will talk about rational group algebras of generalized strongly monomial groups. And we've got two minutes on the clock for you. Go ahead. <laughs> so I'll present my work on primitive idempotents and unit groups of rational group algebras. The motivation behind this work is, for any finite group G, it is a bit difficult to understand the unit group of its integral group ring. But it is well known that unit group is finitely generated, but the explicit generators are not known even for the cyclic group. So the problem is reduced to find the subgroup of finite index in the unit group of integral group ring. Earlier results on such a subgroup is uh, done for uh, groups of nilpotent, uh, nilpotent groups of odd order, but the subgroup structure of such groups are also not known. The most latest known case is for a metacyclic group, which is semi-direct product of CPM with CQN with faithful action, and a finitely generated subgroup of finite index in unit group has been provided for that group. 
our contribution to this area is for this class of groups called generalized strongly monomial groups, which is vast, so vast class of monomial groups that till now, every known example of monomial group has been proved to be generalized strongly monomial. And for this class of groups, we provide primitive idempotents and we provide explicit generators of subgroup, which is a finite index in the unit group. So we proved that simple component of this group algebra is tensor product of these two subalgebras B and centralizer of B in A. And we computed primitive idempotents for these two subalgebras and proved the primitive idempotents of this simple component is product of uh, both uh, primitive idempotents of both these subalgebras. And finally, we computed three nilpotent groups which together generate a subgroup of finite index in the unit group. Thank you. And the next speaker will be Tiago Holleben from Dalhousie University in Canada, and he will talk about Lefschetz properties of square-free monomial ideals. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit about algebraic combinatorics and more specifically Lefschetz properties. So imagine you're in a room and you have many boxes in front of you and you're given the simple task of putting some apples inside those boxes. But you have to take care of some restrictions. So given any box, it can have at most one apple inside it. It's okay if it doesn't have any, but it can have more than one. You also have to take care of some restrictions such as in this example on the left, for example, uh, if you put an apple in box A, you can't put an apple in box B. So for each edge of the graph that we have, only one of the two boxes can have a, an apple inside them. And then, well, what you want to do is you want to count in how many ways can you do it. So if I give you no apples, it's very simple. You can't do anything, you only have one way to do it. If I give you one apple, you can choose one box, and you put an apple there, and so you have the number of boxes of possibilities. If I give you two or more apples, it's a little bit complicated, but if you check all the possibilities, we get that it's five, sorry, six, one, and then zero. Now, if we look at this sequence, we realize that it starts at one, it increases up to, up to some point, so it goes five, six, and then it starts decreasing. So it goes to one and then back to zero. What we want to prove is we want to prove that sequences like this have this property. It turns out that many sequences in combinatorics, they have the, exactly this property and arise from problems like this, okay? And, well, it just happens that one way to prove it is by proving that some matrices have full rank, matrices like this one that you have here. So in my research, what I do is I look at matrices like this and I study where else do they appear. So of course they appear in combinatorics in problems like this, but they also appear in commutative algebra, in algebraic topology, or for example, algebraic geometry. So if you want to hear more about it, come to my poster and we can chat about it. Thank you. Apples leading the way to think about a very interesting problem. So now, Andre Cavallo from the University of Porto and his topic are, sounds very simple, but let's see, eventually fixed points of virtually free groups. So I will be talking about groups and uh, more precisely about endomorphisms of groups which was the main topic of my PhD thesis. Uh, we studied endomorphisms of groups from different perspectives. So a point is fixed by an endomorphism if it's equal to its own image. And a point is periodic if it is fixed by some power of the endomorphism. So it's interesting that these points form subgroups of your original group, and they have interesting properties, and they have been studied by many people in many classes of groups from different perspectives, and there are results uh, from more algebraic point of view, dynamical point of view, and others. For example, in the free group, uh, it turns out that these subgroups are finitely generated. It was proved in the late 80s. Their rank is bounded by the rank of the ambient free group. Uh, it was proved in the early 90s, and very, very recently, it was proved that these subgroups are computable. So there is an algorithm that takes as input an endomorphism and outputs a finite set of generators for these subgroups. What we did, or part of what we did, was taking this analysis a little bit further, and we considered eventually periodic points and eventually fixed points. So an eventually periodic point 
is a point such that if you keep iterating your endomorphism, at some point you reach a periodic point. And so the orbit looks something like this. Uh, an eventually fixed point is, as you could expect, something that when you keep iterating, you reach a fixed point. So the orbit looks like this, but without the circle, just the straight part. Well, typical fixed and periodic points don't have this straight part, don't have this tail. So we can ask basically the same questions. These form subgroups, so are they finitely generated? Is their rank bounded in some way by the rank of the original group? And are they computable? Well, we studied these questions for the class of virtually free groups, a little bit larger than the class of free groups. And well, if you're curious about the answer to any or all of these questions, I'm happy to tell you more about it in the poster. Thank you. Okay, and now we will move on with someone from India again, Samandeep Kaur from Punjab University, and she will talk about on common index divisors of certain quintic number fields. The floor is yours. <laughs> My area of research is algebraic number theory. Um, and it is a classical problem in algebraic number theory to characterize whether a number field K is monogenic or not. We say a number field K is monogenic if it has an integral basis which consists of a power of a single element alpha and that alpha has to be an algebraic integer. If K has such type of power basis, then we say that K is monogenic. It is well known that every quadratic and cyclotomic fields are monogenic. Now, if we have a number field k and the degree of extension of k over q is strictly greater than 2, then to say whether k will be monogenic or not is not an easy one to answer. So, uh, what type of primes which will cause the obstructions to monogeneity? That primes will be basically the primes which will be the, uh, which, which will divide the index of the field k. What we'll uh, define as the index of the field K, uh, you can uh, see it in the slide that it is the GCD of AK is to Z alpha, where uh, AK is to Z alpha is the group index. So if a number field K has uh, an index divisor, so that field K will certainly be non-monogenic. What we have done for a quinetic number field, which is generated by an irreducible polynomial of the type X raised to power 5 plus AX plus B, we have proved that this number field K will have the uh, prime index divisor only when uh, we have the prime 2. So for this field, IK will be either 1 or a power of 2. So what happened when we have the prime 2 to see that, please come and visit my poster. Thank you. Now we are, well, we are happy to welcome our next speaker from the Ukraine. She is right now working at the Czech Academy of Science, Olena Altasiuk, and she will talk about the index of a linear operator and the Fredholm numbers. Please. Good day. It's a great pleasure for me to be here the second time. Newton once said that all process in our life can be described with differential equations. And I guess he was right. So, imagine that we have zero operators with zero index and the next Fredholm numbers. If we want to change at least one component in this matrix, what will happen? The index of this operator will be the same, but the Fredholm numbers will change. Mathematicians in their life, scientific life, have a lot of problems. And one of my tasks is to find the formula or the method that can help me to calculate the Fredholm numbers of some operator that I associate with some systems of ordinary differential equation. What else? You know, all people try to find some smooth solution in their problem. Mathematicians are not exception. So we managed to find, to obtain the necessary and sufficiently conditions when our solution of our problem are continuity with respect to the parameter in some functional space. 
And for understanding it better, I sincerely invite you to visit my poster and dive in mass deeply. Thanks a lot. Jung Soo Kong is the next speaker to enter the stage. He is working at Temple University and will talk about multilayer potentials associated with the higher order Cauchy Riemann operators in uniformly rectifiable domains. Please. Um, so, what I'm going to speak today is about the multilayer potential operators associated with the higher order Cauchy Riemann operator. So, um, the classical Cauchy operator is one of the most famous singular integral operators in mathematics. And this has been studied by many mathematicians over the years. And there are a lot of applications of the classical Cauchy operator to first or second order boundary value problems. So here, the poly Cauchy operator is a higher order generalization of the classical Cauchy operator. And this opens the door to many applications for the higher order boundary value problems. Um, for the geometric assumption, we consider the domain omega in R2 is a uniformly rectifiable domain. This is pretty general geometric domain. For example, this allows us to have a cusp on the boundary, which is rougher than the Lipschitz domain. So um, some of the main results include the poly Cauchy reproduction formulas, high order Fatu theorems, high order Hardy spaces, and we were able to generalize the Calderon and Jago projections with respect to the higher order. And we provided the further observability of Riemann Hilbert problems for polyanalytic functions. And there will be more details and applications in my poster and poster session. So if you're curious about it, please come and visit my poster. Thank you very much for your attention. And then we will listen to Aaron Fernandez from Eastern Mediterranean University, and he will talk about general classes of operators in fractional calculus and their relations. Please welcome him. Hello, and thank you. I am working in a field called fractional calculus, and this is an old topic as an idea. It dates back to Leibniz. And the main idea of this topic is how can we generalize derivatives and integrals to orders outside of the integers? If you look in this uh, diagram, you can see the integer order derivatives, one, two, three, and negative integers given by the fundamental theorem of calculus. What lies in between the integers? Can we define derivatives and integrals to rational orders, to real orders, even to complex orders? Now, we can define these things, but the definitions are not unique. So there is no one way to define, for example, a derivative to order one half. There are many different operators that could be called fractional derivatives. So we need to understand how to classify these operators, how to connect them with each other, and this is what part of my research is related to, uh, the classes of operators and the connections between them. So in the picture here, you can see uh, some of the many operators of fractional calculus. In the middle, in red, is riemann liouville which is the classical operator, classical fractional calculus. And outside this are a few more in blue, which are specific fractional derivative operators. And to the sides, in green, are some general classes. Now, general classes are important because they gather various different operators into one class. So you can prove something in the general class, it has consequences for all of those special cases, but in the general class you still have some uh, unifying behaviors. Also important is that everything connects back to riemann liouville So I'm working on promoting these connections, for example, connections via conjugation, which is an algebraic idea, connections via series formulae, which is an analytic idea, and every connection is useful because it helps us to use the classical results to prove things in the general classes, which are then can be extended further. If you want to see more details about this, you can come and see my poster. Thank you. Thank you. That were our first 
10 speakers and I think they all did a great job because they had just a three hour training session yesterday to practice for this poster flash. And now we will enter to a new group of topics and um, coming from a more applied field of mathematics. And the first speaker will be Sascha Gautlitz from Humboldt University in Berlin. And he will talk about the estimation for the reaction term in semilinear SPDEs under small diffusivity. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you for the very kind introduction. So it's a very long title, but don't be afraid. I will make everything uh, explainable. Okay, let me start my talk by drawing your attention to the two figures on the top of my slide. On the left, you have an image from precipitation forecasts, whereas on the right, you have an image from cell motility. Now, these two phenomena happen, of course, on very different length scales and seem to be very unrelated. But if you think about them on a more abstract level, these are just two examples of processes that evolve both in time and in space. And as these kinds of processes are all around us, it's of great importance to understand and to mathematically model them. One way to model them is by using so-called stochastic partial differential equations, short SPDEs. Don't worry about the technical details. You can think of them as being some kind of mathematical recipe. And with any kind of recipe, for example, a cooking recipe, there are certain ingredients to it, certain procedures that you need to follow to really make a good meal. The same is true uh, for these kind of models. And now my research is focused on answering the question, assume you just see the meal, so the final result of the procedure, can you then infer on what kind of ingredients and what, of, what kind of procedures were used to, con to cook this meal? For example, we had this very uh, nice cake uh, this morning in the coffee break. So the task would be now, just by tasting the cake, can you infer on the ingredients? And now leaving the analogy to cooking and going back to mathematics, we assume that we are given some kind of observations, for example, micro microscopy uh, images of cells moving in a petri dish. And then we want to calibrate our, in this case, SPDE models to this kind of uh, uh, data that we saw. And if you want to know more about this and also what kind of rigorous mathematics can you do here, what kind of properties can you prove, then please join me at my poster. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And now we will move on with Deba Smita Loha, working at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems, and she will be talking about expanding the horizon of finite precision analysis. Um, so first, I want to start with what I mean by finite precision analysis. So when you design an algorithm, you don't really care about precision. Everything is real arithmetic. But when you want to implement these uh, algorithms in finite precision hardware, you have to implement the reals into either floating point data type or in fixed point data type. And of course, in, in introducing any finite precision will introduce some errors in the computation as well. And um, the accuracy analysis part of finite precision actually computes how much error you are introducing in the program given a precision. And one way to compute uh, the accuracy of a program would be to compute the maximum of the difference between the real valued implementation and the finite precision implementation. And another analysis could be the optimization where you want to minimize the precision that you want to assign to the program that still guarantees some error bound. So basically here the idea is you want to uh, find a trade-off between the accuracy and the efficiency. And in my research, I have been working in both this direction and I want to make them more practical while being sound. And one practical scenario could be that in your input, you have uncertainties. And in our work, we could take into account these uncertainties in the input and uh, can compute which error is more likely. And we have a tool that can do that automatically. And for the optimization part, we focused on neural networks. So they are everywhere, but when you want to implement them in finite precision hardware, you have to quantize them in order to make them more resource efficient. And we have a method that can do this automatically. 
So you don't have to read the program. Uh, my, uh, what I wanted to show you is we can generate a full-fledged implementation that you could directly run on custom hardware or FPGA. And we do have a tool for this also, it's called Aster. If you're interested in any of these projects or want to know more about finite precision analysis, please come and talk to me. Thank you. Okay, the next poster flash will be given by Elisabeth Witzer, an Austrian working at Uppsala University. And um, she's got a rather long title. She will be talking about equivariant multimodal image representation for image registration. Thank you. So um, my work is on multimodal image registration. And multimodal images are images that you um, capture with more than one sensor. So in microscopy, that often means that you will take your physical sample from one machine to the other, because very often you need two different microscopes to capture those image modalities. And that means that the images that you get are not spatially aligned, um, because they will shift when you, use the sample, like when you use the sample from one machine to the other. So um, before you can actually fuse the information from these different sensors, you will have to find the spatial transformation to align those images. And because the sensors have complementary information about the sample, they can look very differently. So you can see um, these two images are the very same sample, but they look very differently. Um, so this is a very challenging task uh, because of this very nonlinear relationship between pixel intensities. And what I'm working on right now is to use representation learning, um, and particularly uh, contrastive learning and other methods that actually come from self-supervised learning to learn um, image-like 2D representations that these uh, multimodal images have in common. So you can see an example here below those original images. Um, and they uh, are similar in intensity. They extract structures that are common to both of the original images. And they're similar enough for us to actually use uh, monomodal registration methods. Thank you. from the Technical University of Berlin, and he's got a very short title so that I even don't need the card. Motion from shape change is his topic. The floor is yours. I want to start out my presentation by asking you if you've ever thought about what snakes, jellyfish, or astronauts have in common. Probably not, but they all use specific sequences of poses in order to generate some kind of motion. This may be translation and or rotations. Turns out that there is a particularly nice uh, geometric formulation of this phenomena in terms of a so-called fiber bundle, which allows a unified treatment of these situations and many, many more. For this, we distinguish between a shape, that is a specific pose a body may take, and uh, the respective positioning in space. This looks like this here on the left. The fibers can be thought of the positionings of a specific shape. Uh, an interesting question is now, given a sequence of shapes, how can we position them in space to obtain physically meaningful motion from this? Um, as it turns out, for many scenarios, the answer is to go horizontally from fiber to fiber. And what needs to be horizontal is determined by the choice of Riemannian metric on the space of position shapes. The metric we choose determines the physics we model and vice versa. So how can we make things move? Let's consider um, a periodic motion that is a closed curve in shape space. The metric may cause some curvature of the bundle we consider, and we see that going around our periodic motion, we end up in the same fiber, this, the same shape, but at a different positioning, and that is what we perceive as motion. Following this simple principle, we can derive an algorithm allowing for all kinds of fun simulations. You can come and check out my poster if you want to see how to teach an armadillo the art of springboard diving. Thank you. Victoria Sanchez Munoz is next from Galway University, and she will talk about CHSH game with three players in a triangle. Let's hear. <laughs> 
artificial intelligence and machine learning are the present, but quantum is the future. That means that we would like to do computations, communicate, and do cryptography using quantum resources. Of course, it is very, very hard, and there are a lot of problems and challenges, but the good thing is that we can study these problems as games, and that's what I do. So let's play a game, like we did yesterday. But instead of the laureates as the players, we will have Alice, Bob, and Carl, who will receive a binary input, X, Y, and Z, which is represented by the yellow coin there. And they must output a binary variable as well, A, B, and C, the brown coin. They'll be playing this game, the CHSH game, pairwise, as you're seeing there. So for instance, for the first game between Alice and Bob, they will win if that condition is satisfied. Where's the quantum? Well, the quantum is that the players also have quantum coins or qubits represented by this quantum state. What I'm studying is the situation of how I, do I produce this quantum state. So either I produce this quantum state as producing three qubits at three qubits, that's your image on your left, or I produce two qubits, two qubits, and two qubits, with the image on your right. And how these two different quantum resources affects the game. One milestone that we have is we will like to have the quantum internet. So that means having nodes doing tasks or playing games, and they will be connected by quantum resources. That will be one application of my work, but I just do it because it's fun. Thank you. From the Indian Institute of Technology at Delhi, Zahil Manchanda will enter the stage and talk about lifelong learning to solve mixed integer programs. Hello, everyone. We're going to talk about machine learning and optimization problems. Thank you very much. A lot of you would have come across optimization problems in the real world. Let us take an example. Imagine a truck driver has to deliver a lot of packages in a city, and the objective is to cover all the places in the city using the least amount of fuel possible. And there's also a constraint, for example, that you have to finish all the deliveries in maximum like three hours. A lot of problems of such form can be formulated into something called a mixed integer program, where you have to minimize or maximize an objective function, and your solution should be adhering to certain constraints. Industries solve these problems very regularly. Sadly, these problems are, a lot of these problems are NP hard, and it takes a lot of time to solve them. In our work, we investigate whether we can learn to solve these kind of hard problems. Now, why do you want to learn to solve these problems, right? So it has been seen that instances of the same problems, for example, that we saw earlier, have a very similar shared structure in many occasions. And when you have shared structure, similar structure, machine learning guys will always dive, dive into to capture that structure. And as ML hardware is getting very, very faster, so as time progresses, we can have a very good inference time for, these kind of, uh, for solving these kind of hard problems using machine learning. So far, so good. ML is doing a good job. But the problem is, industries are generating a lot of data at a very regular pace. Now, if machine learning models are asked to learn on new data, sometimes they tend to forget what they learned in the past, unlike humans. So in this work, we investigate whether we can have machine learning models to solve these kind of NP hard problems in a lifelong fashion without forgetting what they learned in the past. I hope to see you at my poster. Thank you. Ridal Eganesi from Kwama Nikwama University of Science and Technology will talk about the evaluation of European option pricing. So you would agree with me that most men here go to the market than women do. Now this market can be 
both a physical market or an online transaction, where we both buy and sell a product. Now, derivative markets here is a form of financial market where people go into contract, that is the buyer and then the seller. This contract involves an underlying asset and some future reference for prediction. Now, the big question is, when do one terminate his or her contract? And when do one execute his or her contract? That is a big question. Now, the obvious solution is that one will want to look at the dynamics of the underlying asset from history to current without being able to make a decision, not really. And so the best way is that with the beauty of mathematics, we are able to mimic these dynamics using differential equations. These equations need to be solved and to produce a great solution. And this is why I contribute to knowledge. I implement a method called legendary wavelet technique to solve this differential equation. This technique is simple to implement and it guarantees a great solution. And with this result, one can tell whether to terminate the contract or execute the contract on a balanced scale, because at the end of the day, both parties would expect a win-win and make profit. Thank you. Our next speaker is working at the University of Texas in Austin. It's Machas Leonardis, and he will talk about what can computability theory tell us about machine learning. We've heard a lot about machine learning models recently. They have had a lot of success. Uh, both the generative models and the classifiers and the techniques for creating those models have recently resulted in sort of a lot of success. And that kind of makes it sort of a good time to really sort of ask the question about what is the potential, both of the models and for sort of techniques for producing them. If I have sort of my, you know, sort of cat and dog classifier, what, uh, and I just sort of keep feeding it these images of cats and dogs, um, presumably I'm sort of getting a better model that can distinguish between cats and dogs, but, you know, do I get one that is also able to distinguish clothes? sort of probably not, or, or do I? Um, and so that kind of sort of naturally leads to the question of what is kind of the right framework for thinking about the potential and capabilities of existing models and those in the future. Um, and I've been thinking about sort of the frameworks for that and um, sort of inspired, and I've been particularly curious about some that have been sort of inspired by philosophy of science because, well, we presumably use science to understand the world. And um, something that a lot of these different philosophies of science agree on is this sort of vision of science where um, um, there is, you know, sort of um, all of our sort of theories or paradigms are sort of conjecture. Everything is sort of open to revision and, you know, um, we never halt on some final and complete understanding of the world, yet um, nonetheless there is a sense we are learning more about the world over time. And so if we require our machine learning techniques to kind of live up to that standard, um, then kind of something surprising sort of, sort of happens. One can kind of ask, what sort of functions can one compute in this way? Um, and it turns out that um, um, uh, to connect to the computability theory, um, so it has many concepts, but chief among them are computable functions and this arithmetical hierarchy. And it turns out that the functions that are knowable in this way are more than the computable functions and indeed even more than the holding problem, they are the second level in that hierarchy. Um, and uh, if you want to know more about, uh, um, you know, what that means for machine learning models and all the details, uh, just like everybody else, I have a poster too. Thank you. This was kind of a bridging presentation as you can now switch your mind to computer science. The next group will be computer science uh, presentation. And we start this group with Catherine Chen uh, working at the University of California in Berkeley. And she will talk about comparing brain representations of lexical semantics across different natural languages. So throughout the world, many people, including probably most of you all, can fluently understand more than one language. So how are different languages processed in the brains of multilingual individuals? If you look at clinical data or behavioral data, you get some contrasting evidence. So on the one hand, you have evidence of shared representations. When you learn a second language, that might affect how you process words in your native language. And when people lose the ability to speak, they usually lose this ability across all languages that they know. On the other hand, you have evidence of different processing. So you might understand the meaning of a text differently depending on if you read it in your first or second language. 
and people who lose the ability to speak sometimes regain this ability in one language, but not others. To understand how different languages are processed in the brain, I use functional neuroimaging to study brain representations that underlie language processing. In this study, I focused on one aspect of language, lexical semantics, or the meanings of individual words. I collected data from fluent bilingual participants, so people whose first language is Chinese and also fluently speak and understand English. And we had them read a few hours of natural narratives, so stories that you might read in your free time in both languages. While they were reading these stories, we used fMRI to collect recordings of their brain responses to the words in these stories. And then we used a combination of tools from natural language processing and various statistical analyses to model how different types of words are represented in the brain in English and in Chinese in these participants. And if we compare the representations, so here the different colors represent different types of words, we find that brain representations are not exactly the same between languages, but there's a striking similarity between participants' first and second languages when they're reading stories in these two languages. If you'd like to learn more about this study or other work in language and neuroscience, please feel free to find me. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome Laura Stegner from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And care is an urgent problem in many societies around the world, and she will talk about end-user development for personalized care robots. Hi, everyone. So I am interested in integrating robots into complex ecosystems, such as healthcare or assisted living settings. And so how can we do this? Well, I use a mix of qualitative and technical methods. So first, I use qualitative methods to understand the stakeholders and the environment. So I'll go to a setting, I'll do observations, I'll talk to the different stakeholders, uh, we'll do design activities together so that I can understand where are the interesting research questions that we need to spend our focus. Then I take what I've learned and then we design and evaluate solutions. In this case, typically, we make an interface that incorporates some AI and formal computational methods um, to allow people to interact with the robot more successfully with the constraints of their natural environment. And as a note, remember that robot because you want to recognize it in the picture on the next slide. So I specifically focus on robots to help provide care to older adults in assisted living settings. As many people may be aware, there's a growing crisis of providing care to individuals due to an increasingly aging population around the world and an increasing shortage of caregivers. So people have often thought, okay, robots can help supplement this care. We don't want to replace human caregivers, but we need something to help fill the gap. So I have partnered with a local assisted living facility to understand the needs of both caregivers and older adults and envision what kind of robots and systems we need to integrate robots into this complex care setting. For example, we found that caregivers have very busy, hectic, dynamic schedules, and so they need quick, on-the-fly tools to be able to tell robots what tasks they should complete. However, the system also needs to consider safety and reliability to avoid causing harm. With older adults, on the other hand, we found that they often struggle to interact with the robot because they can have some issues with physical impairment or cognitive decline. And so they need very simple, natural inputs to be able to communicate with the robot. And so what we do is we build end-user systems, novel end-user tools that use AI and formal methods to help address these problems. And I have some examples on my poster, so feel free to stop by. Thank you. Okay, the next presentation from Xinang Shu from Harvard University will deal with probing biological and artificial neural networks with task dependent neural manifolds. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, so now uh, we are at an exciting moment of human history where the technologies for both artificial intelligence 
and biological in intelligence are rapidly growing. And as a scientist training theoretical computer science, math and physics, and neuroscience, I view this as a complex system where interesting computations such as image classification or like playing Go are emerging from complicated neural activations, sometimes termed as neural representation. And understanding uh, like how this emerging process happened can now is not only of uh, intellectual interest, but also can have wide uh, application, such as uh, help us understand how to deploy the, uh, artificial intelligence wisely. And we are adapting, adopting some uh, interdisciplinary approach, trying to uh, develop, develop a set of uh, intermediate level abstractions, helping us to have an intermediate understanding to bridge this uh, emerging process. So now, let me be more uh, concrete. Say we're interested in uh, image classification, and we want to classify between cat and dog, we can define this uh, object manifold of cats capturing different invariants of the activations of uh, neurons when they see different types of cat images. And we can also define some latent invariants uh, manifold where it corresponding to different angles or positions of the stimulus. And what we're doing is like we use different uh, concepts such as coding capacity from information theory or mean field calculation from statistical physics, convex optimization and so on to normatively derive measures that can help us understand the organization of these manifolds and how it connects to the computational efficiency on top of them. Yeah, and we also apply this widely to like biological data and deep neural networks and see some differences that cannot easily seen by uh, traditional statistical methods. Yeah, thank you for your attention. This is uh, my talk. Thanks. Mark Shadab from the Technical University of Munich and he is working in the field of sustainable serverless computing. Your two minutes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so tackling climate change uh, is a, uh, for reducing and eventually eliminating carbon emissions is a significant milestone for establishing a sustainable environmental society. Towards this, uh, we as uh, the computing society uh, should uh, eliminate uh, carbon emissions. Uh, so serverless computing, uh, aka function as a service, is a new cloud computing paradigm uh, in which users implement fine-grade pieces of code called functions that are packaged and deployed onto a function as a service platform. All responsibilities around infrastructure management, such as resource provisioning and automatic scaling, are then automatically handled by the fast platform. Some prominent examples of fast platforms include uh, AWS Lambda and Google Cloud Functions. These functions are executed in the cloud provider's data centers, which are forecasted to consume between 8 to 13% of the world's total electricity by 2030. Typically, uh, these cloud providers observe around 1.1 billion function invocations each day. However, uh, the geographical region uh, for serverless function execution is pre-selected uh, during function deployment in all commercial FAST offerings. As a result, uh, the varying geographical identities of different regions are not accounted for in serverless function execution. Green Courier uh, builds on de facto cloud native technologies it executes function in the most carbon efficient region at runtime and can significantly reduce uh, operational carbon emissions per serverless function invocation. If you're interested in chatting about sustainability, uh, feel free to drop by my poster. Thank you. Next is Suman Boy from the National University of Singapore and her field is chronic disease management with personalized lab test response prediction. Hi everyone. 
So for this presentation, let's go into the healthcare domain. Generally, doctors have a lot of medication titrations to decide the best course of treatment regimes to manage diseases for different patients. In order to understand the effectiveness of these treatment regimes, generally a lot of invasive lab test procedures are required. Interestingly, the patients are often put off by these invasive procedures and they don't like to keep their hospital appointments. Now this leads to bad disease management. So what we think is if we have an AI system that can predict the personalized lab test response of a patient to different treatment regimes, we could reduce these frequent invasive lab test procedures and the, doc and the patients would come up and show to their appointment at a regular basis. However, there are certain challenges associated with this task. Different patients might have different co-occurring diseases as well as they might be taking different combination of medications as well as dosages. Now these factors impact differently for different patients and might lead to different lab test responses. So what we provide here is a solution or I would say a potential solution called CAL which stands for Knowledge Augmented Lab Test Prediction. So here we have two steps. So the first step is about creating an effective patient representation where we learn the patient history as well as the similarity among other patients. And then the next step is about augmenting this representation with the knowledge about the factors that impact the lab test response. So finally, by combining these two, we intend to predict the personalized response of a patient to different treatment regimes. If you guys are interested in this work and want to chat more, you can find me today at my poster or you can come and chat with me anytime through the week. Thank you for your time. And another presentation from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi and uh, Shaila Pandai. Her topic is the efficient task mapping of deep neural networks. Uh, let me begin by introducing 3D DRAM. A 3D DRAM is essentially a stack comprising several DRAM dies which are connected using fast interconnects known as TSV. Each die houses uh, several independent physical channels and each channel in turn comprises several banks. While such an stacked architecture results in very high memory bandwidth as high as 1 terabytes per second, however, and also it helps in reducing the form factor significantly, however, the power density becomes really high causing poor heat dissipation capabilities and as you can see there is a thermal gradient uh, across the DRAM stack. Therefore, uh, such memories suffer from high DRAM temperatures and uh, undergo temporary uh, memory throttling requiring dynamic thermal management. So, uh, how can we beat the heat while running deep neural networks in 3D DRAM systems? So, the plot here shows uh, the peak DRAM temperatures while running a very popular uh, neural network called VGG16. As you can see, the temperatures uh, that are attained for several layers of VGG, they are as high as 100 degrees Celsius and even upon layer transitions, the temperature varies significantly. So, towards this, we observe that DNNs execute in phases and how can we manage such temperatures is well, I try to leverage the application knowledge and deploy microarchitecture based uh, optimizations. So basically what I try to do is efficiently schedule the DNN layers onto the processing cores and intelligently map the data corresponding to DNN layer on 3D DRAM such that the overall thermal footprint of the application can be minimized and it works really well. Thank you.
Okay, Ankan Malek, Indian Institute of Technology, Kwangbapa, and he will be talking about exploring generic multilingual human intention dynamics and domain-specific applications in Indian scenarios. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. So, myself, Ankan. I am a Prime Minister Research Fellow in IIT Kharagpur, India. Let's see the world. Most of the systems are mostly developed on resource-rich language like English, Spanish, Portuguese, French or German. But let's focus on these areas like Asia, Africa and South American languages. These are really low resource language settings. So we need to explore them. First I explore the Indian specific language and later we focus on that. Now what is intent? So the first example, book restaurant or the play music, if at the uh, first time these type of intents are known, then in the second time, the same example, the different example of the same intent categories can be identified easily. But let's say new intents are coming like red book, how system can identify it in a single go with minimal cost. So the thing is handle emerging single or multiple novel intents and choose a limited number of samples so that the cost is fixed, you cannot exceed the cost and you can identify them with optimized accuracy. Now let's see the domain specific application in healthcare scenario. See the first row, can anesthesia during surgery cause memory loss or signs of senility? Say memory loss and signs of senility are disease intent category, drug, is, drug category is anesthesia and surgery is treatment category. Now this is a major category of treatment intent. So how can we identify it? So we have developed it English, Hindi, Bengali and five other Indian languages and later we try to focus on different South American and African languages. And we need to focus on a single model that can identify in different languages together. Now what is the future scope? So first we can do active learning scenario. So it can handle the rejected samples easily and misclassified utterances. Say so total there is 16,000 samples. So we can identify only 4,000, 25% of all of that. So review the limited utterances by humans, the cost is limited, we can update the model and boom, it increases the accuracy a lot. What can be the other scope? We can do automated question answering system and design the chatbot, which can work in multilingual scenario, also in the code mixed and code switching scenarios together. Also we need to identify different temporal characteristics, how it is working together properly and whether it is judgmented fair or not. This is also important, whether this intent category's detection is fair or not. Thank you everyone, hope you will attend my poster and let's connect if you're interested. Thank you. Martin Ferriens, University College of London, and his topic is Enhancing Calibration and Efficiency of Neural Networks for Real-World Deployments. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And in my talk, I would like to discuss how we can make neural networks more practical and trustworthy. So in order to use neural networks in, in the real world, we need to be able to trust them. And we can establish the trust in them by looking at the confidence of their predictions. Ideally, we would like the confidence of their predictions to match their accuracy. For example, if a network is 80% confident, we would like it to be 80% accurate. However, these confidence calibrated neural networks are more complex. They are quite slow. So imagine the scenario where we, you would like to diagnose an electrocardiogram. You need to do it fast. So you have two options. You can either process it through a standard confidence uncalibrated neural network, which is small, it's gonna be fast, or a confidence calibrated network, which is going to be rather complex and the prediction is going to be slow. So if we are going to obtain the predictions, the standard network very likely will be confidently wrong, which is undesired, but the prediction is going to be fast. Whereas the complex network is going to be rightfully uncertain because this is an anomaly, but the prediction is going to be slow. 
So in my research, I'm trying to op explore the trade-offs between the confidence calibration, accuracy, and the hardware performance. And to do that, I have proposed several solutions. For example, the quantization of confidence calibrated neural networks to improve their hardware performance, adding noise during training of standard net neural networks to improve their calibration, or lastly, compress, rather surprisingly, multiple predictors into a single network network architecture to simultaneously improve the hardware performance as well as the confidence calibration. And this has been successfully applied in classification, regression, or anomaly detection. Please come and talk to me at the poster or scan the QR code to get in touch with me. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've got three left, and the next one will be Yasira Shandil from the University of Massachusetts, and her topic is Towards Secure and Immersive Mixed Reality. Hi, today I'm going to talk about my work on safety in mixed reality. Mixed reality is an intersection between the real and virtual world. In AR, you are just going to see your real world and there are going to be small overlays in your real world. In virtual reality, you have higher interactions but you are completely disconnected with, from your real world. Mixed reality provides a good balance between the two. The task and the goal of this technology is to create immersiveness. This immersiveness is created by using the sensor input that is generated, generated by the environment. That input is sensed by the headset, then sent to the tracking algorithm or all the downstream application services like sensor fusion and all the other object trackings to figure out where the headset is right now. That, that input is then sent to the applications and that applications actually create the sensory feedback for the user using the headset. In my work, what I look into is how these, work, uh, these sensors and these applications can be more physically and cognitively safe. While the immersiveness is a, uh, is a requirement, it is a delicate state. It can be disturbed by any physical or any external or internal activity from either by system's input or by malicious, acti um, malicious attacker outside of the system. In my work, I look into how can we make it safer by looking into tracking, physically tracking, uh, physically improving the tracking of the sensors and improving the cognitive safety by looking into how the user is contextualizing that feedback. If you know, want to know more about my work, please stop by on my poster. Thank you. Roslyn Olobaseum from Landmark University, Omo Aran, and her topic, Fusion Net, leveraging the potential of hybrid mobile net DNN for advanced image analysis. The floor is yours. Hello everyone, I'm here to make um, a presentation, very short one. Um, from literature review, from different review, it has been discovered that um, posture, having a very bad posture causes different diseases like um, cardiovascular disease, spinal cord um, diseases and the likes. So in order to prevent those diseases, we have, um, we researchers have come up with um, trying to detect posture as early as possible so that um, someone that's, uh, that is having a very bad posture or sitting in a very bad um, posture, standing in a very bad posture or any kind of posture can be corrected early so that as to prevent those kind of diseases. But in literature, we have discovered that we have very little data set in this area of research, which has led to coming up with um, algorithms like transfer learning algorithms. And from literature review, it has been discovered that using only one algorithm normally gives um, low accuracy, low precision rate, and other metrics. So because of that, we decided to try another metrics by but uh, hybridizing um, both um, pre-trained algorithm and also a machine learning algorithm. So 
this is the um, proposed model where the pre-trained algorithm was used for feature selection and also deep the DLN algorithm was used for class classification. So um, if you want to get to know how the results went, whether um, it had a very good accuracy or we were able to um, get uh, the proposed um, uh, result, you can meet me at my first stand. Thank you. And our last speaker for today is Kafla M. Sheikh from the CNRS in Montpellier, and she will talk about tsunami predictions. Thank you, Olaf. Um, so, as you said, I'm t uh, my recent work is on tsunamis. Actually, recent results have proved that the existing system of equations that we have that describe tsunamis show a delay in the time arrival predictions of the wave to the shore. And actually, this is attributed to several uh, reasons, two of which uh, of these reasons is the neglection of some physical variables that are necessary in the derivation process. These two variables turn out to be as the butterfly effect and have a huge uh, modification on the final estimation of the velocity and thus time arrival. The two uh, physical variables that we are concerned with are the compressibility of the water from one side and the elasticity of the earth from the second side. So uh, what happens is that upon the arrival of this huge mass of tsunami, there is a pressure that this mass creates on the ground and causes the earth to bend in a um, manner similar to an elastic spring. And then upon the passage of the wave, the earth retains its initial position. So actually we have now two waves interacting with each other and passing information to each other. One in the elastic, uh, the elastic wave in the solid layer and the second is the wave in the compressible ocean layer. And our, um, our duty was to couple these two waves and have a system of equations that, that, that displays both. Uh, the process was challenging, but we succeeded to derive a huge system of equations that describe this, starting from Navistock's system. And um, actually, the system that we got has uh, quite promising uh, results, since it's a hyperbolic system of equations describing dispersion in its most beautiful way. Um, and when we say hyperbolic system, this means that we could, and we are planning, and we are working now on solving uh, the system from the mathematical point of view and from the numerical point of view, uh, proving consistency, stability, and all other properties. But most importantly, one of the beautiful results that we got in the system is that that we could, for the first time, um, qualify the reason behind this delay to the appearance of a negative peak just in front of the main wave of the tsunami. And I'll be discussing this and explaining more in the poster. Thank you so much. I've got two things left. First is, Please see our young researchers downstairs at their posters and talk to them. And second, give them a big hand for 30 really interesting and fantastic presentations. <laughs> <laughs>